distinguished guest. At the desk outside, you will see the opportunity to become members or make donations, and that's what we depend on to be able to give these lectures free uh, week in and week out. So I'd encourage you to have a little visit. Now, Dr. Radusha was born in Houghton, Michigan, and that had the distinct advantage of being close to Thunder Bay, where the CBC station was the only station he could get. And consequently, we managed to propagandize him from an early age. He had studied economics at the University of Michigan, uh, two degrees at Harvard, including his PhD, which he obtained in 1972. Now, normally I'd have notes, but given the subject of this lecture, I've got an iPhone instead <laughs> to help me. Dr. Reduschel had a very distinguished career as a professor of economics and dean of, uh, associate dean of admissions at Harvard, but he is one of those people who has combined not only a very distinguished academic career, but a very successful business career. He is an advisor to many, including various software companies, newspapers, uh, the Daily Mail in particular is one nowadays. He remains an adjunct professor at Georgetown. He has taught at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and he has served uh, for a number of years as the chief technical officer at AOL and AOL Time Warner, and uh, was voted the CTO of the year at some a tremendous point in his life. So the combined successes in two bodies is, is a remarkable achievement, and it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Radishel at this time. Thank you, sir. I was here 23 years ago, and I talked about much the same subject and this was really a unique opportunity to go back and A, watch the video. It's really weird to look at yourself 23 years ago. Uh, and to see how much my views have changed, evolved, or whatever. I was very lucky. I got introduced to computers when I was very young. I was 15, and I was at a summer science institute. And I walked into this room, and we were being shown what a computer was. Now, it was at an Air Force base, maybe it was an Army base actually, that ran the anti-aircraft missiles. And we were at an Air Force bombing base nearby and they defended the base. And what I learned was that the computer could flash a flag and play a song. But it looked interesting. It was about the size of this room. Uh, it was substantially less powerful. I would guess the hundredth of the power of this thing. And, but I said, there's a future here. And I've sort of been following computers my entire life uh, since then. So this is a 40-year journey. And it really started when, at Harvard, I spent five years with John Kenneth Galbraith teaching his course on the new industrial state, which is now 50 years old, almost, in looking at the impacts of technology on society. That led me into doing a course on computers and society, which forced me to go deal and think about these issues in a real way. Walking in and talking to students really does, you know, hone the mind. You really have to think about it. As I said, I was here in 1990. I then went on to do a study at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences on the impact of technology on our economy. And in between, I did a bunch of jobs and with a bunch of companies and learned a lot and had a lot of uh, good experiences along the way. When I was here in 1990, I focused on four disruptions that I said technology was driving in our society, in our economy. The first was the present versus the future. And that what we have today is the ability of information technology to focus us very vividly on what's happening today. We can make Concentrated current pain, very visceral. We just had a public policy debate in the United States in which supplemental food assistance was cut uh, at the national level. It was cut by about 4%. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it was 4%. It was not 50%. If you looked at the news media, the news media was asking people, why are you going to starve now? And people would say, yes. 
And this was there. Now, of course, the whole issue is how much should government spend, and there are consequences to it. But you know, we can make the present very vivid. And the future and what happens to onborn generations, that isn't really very vivid anymore. We can't break that up and put it on a TV news show. So economists talk about the social rate of discount. And the social rate of discount is when you make a decision, how, what moral right do we have as a generation to discount the welfare of future generations when we make a decision? Do I have the right to say that somebody coming down the road should not count, their happiness should not count as much as my current happiness? And this has been debated since the 20s when it was first identified. Pope Benedict, a couple of years ago, came out very strongly saying that the social rate of discount should be zero, that nobody has the moral right to discount the welfare of future generations. Economists will tell you that the right optimal rate is approximately the rate at which the economy is growing. And there's a whole body of theory that uh, when Peter Nemetz and I were in graduate school was very hot and you had to focus on this. The second disruption that's coming from technology is that precision is beginning to drive out accuracy. And by that, I mean that I can take a computer and I can produce a number that looks really, really, really good. And I look at that number and I go, well, this thing is, this alternative is gonna cost $2.7 billion and this one $2.9 billion. So I'm gonna take the 2.7. Well, the point is, we don't really know. The assumptions are really quite different. When I was in graduate school, there's a numerical methods looks at things and tries to figure out how accurate a number is that you've calculated. And my friend in the next office did his entire thesis, and it was on a number in physics. And he'd computed the number to be approximately 2.3. And he'd written in his entire PhD thesis on this. And his professor said, you know, if you get a chance, you should go talk to this new professor about the numerical accuracy of that number. So being a good student, he went and did that. And this other professor went through the calculation and said, yep, your number's 2.3 plus or minus 10 septillion. In other words, <laughs> in other words, it's a random guess, and I have no idea whether he neglected to tell his advisor that he got that advice and got his degree and left. But, you know, it, it, you can make, computers can make a number which is really completely vacuous look very real. And that's a problem. Third thing is something that all of the industrialized economies are talking about today still from 2008, which is too big to fail. Information technology has let us be very, very, very efficient. But as we learned in 2008, it's made us very much less robust. And when one of the assumptions goes wrong, we have a lot of trouble. So we, we haven't resolved this issue. Anybody who reads modern business and political thing, too big to fail is something we haven't solved. And it's something we wouldn't have if we didn't have information technology. I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase has, what, $3 trillion in, on, in assets and something like 38 million properties. I mean, how do you manage, if you were in a bank, think about how do you send it out an auditor and go, okay, here's 38 million pieces of paper. It's only because of technology that we can have these giant institutions. And then the last thing which has been driven is we have made being in financial services very rewarding because technology has worked faster to let us divide the pie in different ways than it has worked to let us grow the pie. And that's a problem, I think, because the best and the brightest don't go into STEM education, they don't go into other careers, they go into financial because we pay them the most. And you know, if you're growing up, pay is a reasonable indication of what society thinks you're worth, and so how do you make the most money? You go into financial. So we have taken a lot of brains away from that. If I look today, I think that there are five more. One is political gridlock. I spent some time with uh, some political data in the United States about a year ago. And I realized that, at least in the United States, what we have going on is that our president never went to the states, to the districts, that didn't vote for him. Because as political operators, why waste his time? He went to where people could win votes, where he might have an impact on the election. 
So we now have congressmen, presidents, right? They all think they're speaking to their population, but they only spoke to their population. They didn't speak to any of the opposition. So now you get gridlock because you know, people really aren't communicating. I watched, you know, uh, Rupert Murdoch invented, you know, the idea of highly politicized news. You know, people watch, as, you know, they watch an, a very biased source, it's entertainment, they get value out of it. So we're getting political gridlock. And again, technology has enabled that. A big shift that's happening right now is a shift from owning assets to renting assets. You see this, you know, in London, it's Halo, in San Francisco, it's Uber, but you use these phones, there's no longer any value in having a license to drive a cab if all I have to do is pull out my smartphone, which knows where I am, and I say I need a car, and that car shows up two minutes later. And by the way, they bill on this and it all happens. Airbnb is, is beginning to take noticeable chunks out of the hotel industry. I built the campus that today is occupied by Facebook when I was at Sun. Facebook puts three times as many employees in those buildings as we thought we could put. It's called densification, in case those of you might think of it as overcrowding, but it's a nice word, densification. And, but we are using assets more intensively. And I was at an economist meeting recently where about a quarter of the people there we're beginning to see impacts. This affects how many cars we have. This affects how many homes we build. This affects whether we rent or buy. It affects how many hotel rooms are built. Because especially the younger generation is, is wanting to live asset light. That's going to have effects on our growth rate, on everything else that happens in the economy. But it's a very big shift. Certainly unless you live in, you know, isolation. Uh, there's been a lot about the loss of privacy and the emergence of the surveillance state. I mean, I think nobody ever thought that you could store all the phone data that's there. But I mean, it, it, roughly to store every voice conversation, not those of you who follow the conversation, metadata, but every phone call made in the United States is about $30 million a year. It's nothing, right? It's cost of all this stuff has gone down. So you, somebody could really store every phone call and then go back and look at it, you know, years later. So, I mean, Again, no one ever thought about this. There's an argument that Google is making us dumber because we don't think anymore. If you think about Einstein, Einstein did almost everything as a thought experiment. That's what he could do. He did thought experiments. He sat around and thought about things and conceptualized still the rules that largely govern how we think about physics today. But you know, if you watch a 15-year-old or a 17-year-old, if something comes up, they pull it up and they go to Google right away and they answer it. So is Google making us dumber or smarter? I don't have the answer. But I mean, we don't think in abstract terms as much. We, we quicker to go and look at whatever data is there. And then this is one I'll come back to, is what's clearly happening in every society around the world is this emergence of much greater inequality and tremendous concentration of, of, of wealth and power. This made the news two weeks ago when Oxfam put out their calculation that the 85 richest people in the world held the same amount of assets as the bottom 3.75 billion. Uh, so that the bottom 3.75 billion in assets have as much as the top 85. So this is a very real trend and it's not anything that uh, is gonna be solved quickly. So why is this happening? Well, the answer, is Moore's Law. Now, Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel Corporation, and he mused one day in a trade rag. It was not a major publication. It was a trade rag, a free newspaper given out in the industry. If you have a copy, great. It's worth about $100,000 uh, because people threw them all away. And he observed that in semiconductors, if you plotted the data on a line, every 18 months you got um, you had a 30% reduction every year, doubling every 18 months. That has been true now for over 30 years. The physicists say it clearly has another 20 years to run. It has potentially another 30 years to run. The issue is economics. Making smaller and smaller chip sizes, which is what this is all about, requires ever more expensive gear to do it. And so modern semiconductor fab where these things are made is now about $10 billion. And as this goes up, the costs keep rising. 
So the US Department of Defense just advised its weapons planners who are thinking out 50 years that they should assume that Moore's Law stops in 10. Not because of physics, but because of economics. And the next week, there was an innovation by a Dutch company that said that maybe DOD was wrong. So, But never in history has some, as a resource declined for 30% a year for 30 years, 40 years, maybe 50. It's never happened. I mean, there's no comparable example that you can find. There's more to come. That, that's a, that's an, you know, an L key on a computer and the keyboard and that little dark thing there is a computer. It's a fully functional computer. It has memory, processor, communications. It's got everything that you would need. It's got all the same features that are in a smartphone thing. It's smaller than an ant. This particular one is meant to be swallowed. And it's meant to be swallowed because this will be how you take care of your health. And in the morning, you will take this, and it will broadcast all day what's happening in your body so you have a complete profile of what's there. And you don't have to look for it uh, because it's cheap, and you can just throw it away. <laughs> you can do this today, but you have to recover them. Uh, and Motorola did another variant of this in which you swallow this pill in the morning and it puts a 16-digit number on your skin. So when you touch your skin to your phone or to a mic or to whatever, it would be able to read that number off your skin and you would know where you were. So that when you went to work in the morning, you swallowed the pill and then you could go open all the doors with your hand. I mean, this is what people are working on. Just reporting. So in 1990, I talked a lot about the wonder of single board computers which were the size of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Now we're down to something that is a fraction of an inch. And we're not done, we're not done. Um, you know, one of the next things that comes in the next iteration is something the military calls smart dust, which you literally would just scatter on the ground and when somebody would step on it, these computers would communicate to each other and you would know that somebody's walking in the forest and they'd be cheap enough and small enough, you wouldn't be able to find them. And so they literally are smart dust and they go talk. So that's, you know, it's all happening. So about three months ago, this is the largest, you know, I think it's the fourth largest supercomputer in the world. It belongs to Fujitsu Corporation in Japan. And they were able to simulate one second of 1% of the human brain in 44 minutes. Now, this is important because of what it says and what it doesn't say. It says that today, the brain still wins. This is a computer with about 100,000 processors. It costs millions of dollars, and you can do 1% of the human brain for one second, but that takes 44 minutes. So we're safe for now. <laughs> However, if you work out the calculation, it's about 30 years of Moore's Law before that becomes affordable and uh, is something that you could think about putting in a device like the smartphones we all carry around. So good news is we're not there yet. The bad news is we could get there. In 2002, uh, the Board on Science, Technology, and Economic Policy, which I was a member of, did a study on what's been driving the new economy. And we said, look, you can look at all the data, it's Moore's Law. We also said correctly that starting in the early 2000s, the ability of Moore's Law to speed up existing software was gonna go away. And we we're gonna see a productivity slowdown. For the most part, this study has been proved right. But what's happening now is that we're doing Big data, which means, I mean, big data used to mean thousands, millions of records. Now it means billions of records. And the things that we're processing to understand are, you know, pretty phenomenal. But if you go, Google has a service for doing simultaneous translation. So you can take a phone and I can speak in German and I call somebody, they speak to me, 
back in, uh, they hear German when I talk English, I hear English when they talk German. Yeah. Pretty simple thing, you used to have translators to do it, they're doing it with computers. They use a thousand computers for each side of that conversation. Not one, a thousand. So they're using a thousand, by the way, that's a free service, uh, which shows you how cheap computing has become. And this is brute force. What they do is they actually look up the sound you said in a database of all sounds and figure, they don't try to translate it in any way that a human being would do it. No human being would do it. They do it in a very different way, but they do it much better than any other technique has ever been found. And it's just brute force. And it's brute force because computing is so cheap and so easy to buy. So the question before us is, is this creating jobs? In particular, is it creating good jobs or is it destroying them? So this fall, or last fall, I went to a conference with Robert Gordon from Northwestern University who got a lot of press last year because he argued that diminishing returns to innovation, you know, we've done the big innovation and all the little innovations really don't matter very much, that US, Canada, uh, major European economies basically had to look forward to maybe 100 years of 0.2% economic growth. Now, if you want to get attention, forecast something like this. This gets you lots of speaking opportunities. I mean, it may have been a brilliant business model on his part, but he followed me as a speaker. So, I mean, he, he's a little bit uh, chagrined at the amount of attention he got. But, you know, there are people who really do worry about this. And, you know, there are indirect effects, the globalization of production um, that's going on and the ability to move stuff around, China as the assembler of everything in the world for the whole world. But are we getting jobs from technology? Is it our friend or is it a foe? So The Economist just published their observations on this. And they noted that labor share of output has shrunk globally from 64% to 59%. That's a lot. The share of income going to the top 1% in the US has risen from 9 to 22%. Huge change. In 2000, 65% of working age Americans worked. Now it's down to 59%. Instagram was sold to Facebook with 13 employees for a billion dollars in 2012. And a few months later, Kodak went into bankruptcy. It employed 145,000. So while the internet produces all these wonderful examples of joy and grief and profit and everything, where are the jobs coming from? And they heavily quoted a study done by Frey and Osborne at Oxford. And this is an interesting chart which shows you the probability. They took 702 occupations. And, you know, in the kind of study that I would have difficulty motivating myself to do, they sat down and looked at the attributes of all 702 occupations and how readily they could be done by computers and estimated the probability that you could replace that worker with computers over the next decade. So this chart shows you where they came out, that 47% of employees, there was a high probability that computers could replace them. There aren't a lot in the middle. It's 19%, but basically, you figure, you know, half of those at least get replaced. And 33% are low chance. That's a pretty bleak picture, right? You're talking about over the next 10 years that these people figured that half of all jobs could be replaced by computers. Half's a big number. I mean, if you think about how do you get how do we do that? How, to, how does society deal with this? Uh, and again, I'm sure you can argue with every assumption they made. And I'm sure, you know, different people will come up with the different things. But, I mean, I'm not sure this doesn't look roughly right. It used to be that robots were very expensive because programming them was so hard. You can make the machine. We've been able to make the machine for 15 or 20 years. But programming it was really hard. You had to sit down and go, it's not true anymore. You can go to an assembly line with the new robots and you can put your hand in a glove and then you do something three times and the robot figures it out. And that's all you have to do to program it. 
So the need to go program a robot has become trivial. So, I mean, the, every chance. Almost all these devices that we carry around are made by Foxconn or a company like it. Uh, Foxconn employs, I think it has, what, 4 million, 5 million workers, something like that. No, it's got a million workers. They just ordered 3 million robots. They're planning on coming to North America to make devices like your iPhone, but they're going to make them all with robots, not with people. So, I mean, where, where do jobs come from? And it's a huge question. These authors concluded that the algorithms for big data are getting into pattern recognition, the Google translation I was talking about, and can readily substitute for labor now in a whole set of new tasks. And then advanced robots are gaining senses and dexterity, allowing them for, I mean, you know, we're, it's really hard to see. I mean, surgery is increasingly being done robotically. And you know, you really want the robot surgeon because they make a lot fewer mistakes than other surgeons do. So, does this matter? Does this, does this help? I mean, is increased productivity really going to get the potential output of the economy? If you're a neoclassical economist, as I was trained, this cannot be a problem. All of this has to be nonsense. Because the assumption is that when I increase productivity, I increase the potential of the economy, and I increase the potential of the economy, we'll go find new things to do, and that will employ people in other jobs, everybody will be paid well, and that there's no problem. That is the fundamental assumption in neoclassical economics. Doesn't look like it's coming true. So part of that is software. Now I've been writing software, as I just admitted, for more than 50 years, and Silicon Valley started saying two years ago, look, software is eating the world, and largely true. Turns out getting star software developers are in very scarce supply, and they have been for my entire life. You know, finding these wizards, I, there were articles written about it 30 years ago about how are they hard they were to find. We need a lot more of them now, and guess what? They're still very hard to find. In every major software project, the top two to three percent of the developers typically write 40 to 50 percent of the code. This is a field which is heavily dominated by the very top of the field. Not the A programmers, the A plus programmers, or the A double plus programmers. They're the ones who manage. I'll talk about why a little bit below. Most software is just bad. I mean, the recent fiasco the United States experienced around healthcare.gov is, you know, it, it, it's so bad it's just impossible to, to understand. The people who released that product, it had 93 separate transactions that had to process successfully in order for your application to work. And you had no feedback on whether your data was right until you clicked submit. And it didn't have any error handling. So when you hit submit, you needed 93 separate submissions to all work perfectly or the website didn't work. Guess what? The website didn't work. I mean, it's just bad, you know, I mean, it's impossible. So you need a lot of great software. We're not going to get this stuff unless we get there. So macro, we get jobs if we can get to grow faster. So the people that are out there saying we need stimulus are actually right. And if you've got improved productivity and you want to go create new jobs, You've got to get more growth. You've got to get create opportunity. You've got to get new companies going. So we need aggregate demand. You need innovation. You need entrepreneurs. You need people creating new things. Because if you don't, we're just going to shrink jobs. If you don't grow demand and you don't innovate, jobs are going to go away. We have structural friction, an economist would say, that protects existing business models. And one of the things in which I've spent a lot of my life in the last few years is on copyright law, and I don't want to defend either position here. But the copyright industries have gotten draconian laws in place all over the world to protect their interests against anybody who wants to innovate around them. And whether this is good or bad, it's a, in the end, it's a policy choice. But if you have this, you're not going to have innovation. We're seeing this a lot now over car services, the Uber and the Halos, 
and is this a legal thing, and can you do it, and they get stopped, and there are lawsuits, and consumers like it, so people tend to bend the laws. And then you have, we don't have enough developers. So this, none of that poses, I think, good things. Are there reasons to hope? Well, yes. Medicine is going to change in the next 10 years in ways that I think we have no way to predict. It is in the United States, unlike Canada, 17% of GDP. And, you know, it should be half of that. And that could free up a lot of things and improve things in the U.S. You have your system, and I won't raise that as a topic, or we'll be here the rest of the night. Uh, education is 7% of GDP. And I think everybody understands that it needs reform. But there are huge structural pressures against that. 3D printing is this ability to take an image and then turn it into real. And you can 3D print anything, right? If it's a 3D object, you can 3D print it. Now, the question is, can I 3D print it out of the right materials? And we're getting better and better at that. If you're in material science, you've got a great future here because we're getting better at figuring it out. In medicine, we're 3D printing organs so that the surgeon, before he or she operates, can print out the organ on which the operation is going to be performed and actually practice on you without practicing on you. And, you know, it has a dramatic effect on error rates. Um, we're 3D printing titanium. So if you're an Air Force or an airline and you have to have parts all over the world, you don't need to store them. You just have to have them, you just have to have the image, and then you can 3D print the gear or 3D print the arm, whatever you need. So it drastically changes that. Jewelry, you're going to have the ability to custom design jewelry and have it produced for you. So 3D printing will probably take 20 years, but it too will restructure. Again, it's hard to see how it creates jobs. 3D printing is another one of these things that looks great, but in the end, it's going to improve overall productivity, but where are the jobs going to come from? Emerging markets, if you travel to that part of the world or most of the world, these people want better lives, and information technology has shown them all what it is. You know, there are about eight and a half billion cell phones in the world. I mean, almost everybody has one. And, you know, if you think that means they're looking at video, they're like, I mean, the, the number of smartphones is growing, you know, by a billion a year. Uh, so, you know, you have this dramatic effect, and this is going to drive demand, and that's good. You hope democracy will work and that we'll get rid of artificial barriers and we're going to let the markets work and we're going to get all the stuff we need. And then Bill Joy was a colleague at Sun. He's now at Kleiner Perkins. And one of his laws was innovation always happens, happens where you don't expect it. And guess what? He's right. It does almost by definition. I mean, the people who are in something don't see it and you get innovation that you weren't looking at and, and weren't thinking about and we may get that and hopefully that will solve some of our issues. To give you an example, in Ethiopia there was a water project and it was really a very good idea. It put wells into native villages that didn't have water. And water has an enormous effect on changing the social culture of these villages. It liberates women to go do other things because they are the ones that end up in general, getting the water, it, it creates school, it cre all this opportunity comes from having water. Guess what? They break. The wells break. So they'd go and install them, they'd put people there, and the wells would break. So what they do now is they put sensors that count the amount of water produced each day. They communicate via iridium satellites, and each day they publish to the central source in, in Addis Ababa, how much water was pumped in that village. And if the number's zero, you got a broken pump. And they put people on a motor scooter, and um, they go and repair the pumps. So they've taken what was basically going to be a failed project and made it a savior with fairly trivial application of modern technology, but in a very, you know, very rural area. But they have a solar panel, and they communicate with iridium satellites cover the whole world. And it's only got to send a little bit of data how much water was pumped. And so they've taken it and they made it. So you get tremendous upsides here with very little application of the new stuff. As I said, I taught with Galbraith. That was the book we taught. 
the new industrial state. And what he argued was that the global technical elite, which he called the technostructure, would abrogate wealth and power to themselves over time. And that the challenge for society, writing 50 years ago, is that we would get a lot of inequality and that the global technical elite would take power and wealth. You know, pretty good for a book written in the 60s. Uh, Bill Davidow is one of the leading venture capitalists of Silicon Valley, and he published last week that what people forget to under, you know, forget is that the internet is the greatest legal facilitator of inequality in human history. Uh, this is a man who helped found the Silicon Valley that we all talk about. Why? Because it multiplies the earning power of the very best. Until 2007, there were nobody in the U.S. reported earnings of over a billion dollars. But in 2008, three people had earnings over a billion dollars. This is not capital gains from investment. This is earnings paid as compensation from a company to a, human, to a single individual. And there were three in 2008. The current number is in the 30s. So you have people who are making enormous amounts of money. I mean, it's hard to, you know, I mean, apparent, I, mean I, I read a, a report that said that in 2012, the highest was $13 billion as a single um, W-2 uh, filed. The Treasury Department, by the way, did not have a computer that could handle a W-2 at that level because nobody thought it was possible. <laughs> um, but they found a way to take the taxes. Uh, but the internet's eliminating jobs. We discussed those. And it enables outsourcing to cheaper labor, which is certainly happening. And the point made earlier about Instagram and Kodak is that internet company revenue per employee is five, six, seven times higher than for a bricks and mortar company. So as these internet companies come up and they grow, they, they don't need employees. They don't hire employees per dollar of revenue in the same way the traditional businesses did. So it's this argument, you know, it's position. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to get robust economic growth. And, you know, it's a complex question. It's not, it's not easy. Nobody's quite figured this out. Hollande thought he had an answer in France. Turned out to be wrong. Obama thought he had one in the U.S. and had a bunch of things. It hasn't happened. Uh, David Cameron did what everybody thought you shouldn't do, and the U.K. is now growing quickly. So, um, but, you know, you need growth. And if you don't have growth, you're not going to solve any of these problems. So growth is the number one enemy of all this stuff. We can go focus on what technology is doing, but technology wouldn't necessarily be doing that if we were growing. Now, you can then make a counter-argument, which is the technology is slowing growth because we're sharing assets, we're not building new ones, whatever, anyway. Second thing is, we've got to be very innovation friendly. And you've got to be, really begin to look at laws, everything. How do we get more innovation going? Because if you don't get innovation, you're clearly going to lose jobs. Because innovation is going to be what offsets that by creating new businesses. We have a debt problem. We want to solve all the problems of the current thing at the expense of putting it off on future generations. That's the social rate of discount issue. Again, growth would solve a lot of this, but if you don't solve growth, then you've got to get back to how you solve the debt. The educational system, you know, is it really training the people we need for the future and helps them get what they have to get? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I really have been in education now for a long time. And I just think that we have to have huge changes. They're coming. I mean, there are MOOCs, massively open online education courses that have, you know, this all started at Stanford. They, two professors in artificial intelligence said, well, we got a class for 60 people. Let's put it on the internet and let anybody who wants to take it. Now, you know, they've had about 300,000 people take it. So that was an expansion from 50. Uh, but do you really learn? Not all these people finish it and they don't, but you know, they had tens of thousands want to be graded and actually do the assignments and get graded and go do it. So, I mean, there's gotta be better ways to, to bring, teach us on what we need to know. Too big to fail, we're still arguing over that. It's a big problem. We, we have all these huge institutions and they are too big to fail. And we've allowed that to happen. Do we really want to bite into the, what it's gonna to take to go solve that? And then you have inequality, and how do we address that? 
So I sort of left it there about six months ago and said, well, how do we deal with this? And then I realized that, again, looking back at neoclassical economics, there are two things that really impact our ability to uh, respond to this set of issues. One is something called Halstead Lane. And I've tried to explain this for at least 30 years, and I failed every single time. So this is a new effort at trying to explain it. So if I succeed, I'll be very happy. If I don't, it won't be a surprise. So if you look at this picture and say, assume that this picture describes a problem you have to solve. Maybe it's a business problem, whatever, but that this picture represents what you have to solve. Maurice Halstead was a professor at Purdue, and he studied why some people were really so much better at programming. Remember, 2% of the programmers write 50% of the code. Why? What is it about those people that makes them so productive? And he studied something, and one of the attributes of the human brain that he found, he modestly named Halstead Lane. So why he could do that? According to him, an average person at one time can see that much of that picture. That's the approximate average capacity of the brain to hold information all at once and deal with it. But what he discovered was that when he went to the people who were the really brilliant programmers and measured their Halstead length, this is how much of that image they can see at one time. So this is a very fundamental attribute. I mean, the world looks very different if that's what you have and that. And guess what? People who can see that much of a problem, they're a lot more productive in dealing with complicated issues than are people who can see that much. And so this is a challenge. Now, what do we do? Well, what we usually try to do is we usually try to simplify. And we look at a problem and it's too complicated to comprehend. We throw away detail until it gets simple enough for us to understand. So if you do that, that's what that image looks like. If I reduce it down to where the average person can see the whole image, that's the quality of that image. Now, again, Halstead's dead. So any criticism, you know, um, doesn't, isn't going to bother him. But it, this is a very fundamental aspect of the human brain. And it's just like athletic ability. It's like anything else. It's some blend of nature and nurture. I mean, people have tried for 40 years to figure out why. Mozart had a huge Halstead length. Beethoven had a, you know, you, you know, James Joyce. I mean, anybody who sits down and writes and creates you have to have large Halstead length. This is not an attribute that only matters to programmers. It explains why anybody who's worked in this industry as long as I have, has all of us have people who are great musicians who are great programmers. Because it's the same skill. It's that same ability to be able to comprehend and understand a large, complicated problem. One of the things that is clear is that if you think about our society and where it's going, and complicated systems and being very efficient and all that, all the trends favor people who have longer hall set lines. Unfortunately and ironically, the shift that we have to an always connected culture and the ability to always go to our smartphone is that we're probably lowering hall set lines. We're probably not doing abstract thought. We're making it very easy for you to deal in all these little pieces and coordinate them and put them together. So I, I've resonated with this when I read the book 30 years ago. And you know, it, it's influenced everything I've thought about since then. But I think it's very important because it limits what education can do. If what we need are people with large Halstead lengths, and I think we do, I think we have to figure out how to make them long, we don't know. We have no idea. And this may limit why education is not going to be an easy fix to inequality. Almost every politician I hear everywhere in the world 
acts as if education is going to solve the inequality problem. I'm not sure it will. And you know, there was a, a US politician that said that we should retrain middle-aged autom automotive workers and train them to be great software developers. And you know, if he had a way to do it, I think he's right. But you know, I, nobody knows how to go do that. You know, and my point is, is that education may not solve the inequality issue, just as more coaching cannot make a five foot person a star basketball player in the professional leagues. I mean, there are just limits to what you can do. So this is a challenge for us and something that I think we have to go think through a lot about what we do with education. And the last point is that the foundation of capitalism is this belief in the invisible hand and the belief in free markets. And every conservative politician everywhere in the world can give you this rote. I mean, they know exactly what it is. But if you studied this, you realize that neoclassical economics was actually very good. And it understood that if you had increasing returns to scale, meaning that as I get bigger, I get more efficient, that it doesn't really work. And what's happened is that in almost every industry now, information technology is creating increasing returns to scale, even retailing. People would argue retailing small stores, what can you do? That's all wrong. I mean, you know, one of the great retail stories is what is the most common item purchased with disposable diapers? It's about six years old. The answer is beer. <laughs> now, I'm sure I could survey the audience and not many of you would have said beer. And the reason is that women don't actually buy disposable diapers. They're big, they're bulky, and they fill the shopping cart. So they send their husbands to buy the disposable diapers. <laughs> And the husbands buy themselves a six pack of beer when they buy the diapers. So Walmart saves every register tape everywhere in the world and analyzes them every day. So they know what every shopping cart was everywhere in the world and they analyze it every single day. So they look at it and it's a very easy question to ask and answer. The most common item produced, purchased with disposable diapers is beer. So therefore you put the beer aisle next to the disposable diapers aisle. You know, you'd think you'd put it next to the baby food. No, that's completely the wrong answer. What this is doing is it's creating increasing returns to scale in retailing. Because the small mom and pop shop can't even begin to touch the computers, the software, the data collection, the data analysis. I mean, we know, for example, that if I put an offer in front of you in a store and you can see the item, you're 10 times more likely to act on the offer. So now the game is to figure out how to know exactly where you are. And as you're walking down the aisle, the phone's going to beep, and you're going to be told that that toothpaste that you've been thinking about is available to you at half off. And you can see it. But that means I have to know exactly where you are in the store. I don't have to know that you're in the store. I have to know that you're on this aisle, 16 feet down the aisle, and that's where it is. I mean, it means that even retailing, which has traditionally been, oh, this is going to be mom and pop and stay there forever, it isn't. It's why you have chains. I mean, the software that goes in to um, running retail today is incredible. And most, I mean, Starbucks is all about software. Tesla Automotive has more software engineers than they have mechanical engineers building the car. So every industry is getting caught up in all this. But so in almost every industry, you're getting um, increasing returns, you're getting change, you, we're getting a lot of concentration. So back in the 1800s and 1700s, the focus was on land and on the profits people got from land. And so neoclassical economics has a phrase called economic rent. Now, Economic rent is I make a lot of money. A lot more than I could make in my next best occupation. And it would be defined as the difference between what you make 
and what you could make in the next best thing you did. Superstar salaries, you know, $100 million to the top hockey player, you know, are one manifestation of this. One can argue that technology has greatly multiplied the number of people earning rents, like why does somebody make $13 billion in one year, and increase the size, why does somebody make $13 billion in one year. Now, neoclassical economics also has an answer to this. You tax them away. Because they're a deadweight loss, it's basically a private tax that you get to impose on society, and so the government should just tax them away, and that's the right answer. Now, the problem with this is it's great policy, but those who are receiving the rents never see them as that. The person making all that money doesn't see them as something you should tax away 100%. And so you get to a conundrum. And you know, this is going to be a political debate. But inequality you know, is not going to go away as an issue. And I think that if we do not do something with it, we can expect over the next 20 years that we're going to see civil unrest in a way in every organized society that we've never seen. I mean, the 99, you know, the one percenters in the US and that argument that went on, I think is the tip of an iceberg here because these trends can continue to push it. It's not the top 1%, by the way. It's the top 10th of a 1% or even smaller fraction than that, the enormous amount of the, of the income and wealth. I mean, if you're a hedge fund person and you produce $20 billion in profits for your clients and you want to get a billion of that, you know, that seems like reasonable pay. You get 5% or a third or 20% is what they usually get. And that's how you have concentration. You have one person managing assets. I mean, it, it, it's huge. I mean, I, I was at um, a company in the US that, again, has 13 million different assets on their books. I don't know how you manage that. I mean, no one can manage that. Somebody has to sign an audit report saying this is their value. You, I mean, you're doing that based on nothing. You can't possibly have any idea. So I think there are two issues that really c confound us in terms of policy about what to do about this thing with technology. We're not going to stop it. I mean, there's no way one, I mean, maybe the together and do it. It's interesting there, in Japan in, in the 1500s, they were the best makers of guns in the world. Japan made the best guns in the world in the 1500s. But the rulers of Japan looked at them and said, you know, it's hard to have a samurai sword fight with a gun. And they were correct. And they abolished guns. And Japan eliminated guns in the 1500s. And all guns were banned from the country. Until in 1853, Admiral Perry of the United States Navy showed up in Tokyo Bay and he had big guns, lots of them. And the Japanese said, oh, we probably shouldn't have done that. We were hasty. And um, they had a surrender and then they, then they learned. I, I mean, that's the only example I can think of of somebody taking a technology and saying, let's get rid of it. And that was an isolation of a very isolated nation at the time. And in the end, they paid a large price. So I think this issue about is Halstead length and the, you know, it may be the wrong description in the end, but our ability to go deal with complex systems issues, how do we educate people around that? And is education really going to solve our problem? I don't necessarily think it is. And that's a big problem because almost every public policy response in Europe, the UK, Canada, the United States, we're going to solve inequality through education. It's not clear that is going to solve the problem. You're going to have to do more. And secondly, if you got rents, rents are a problem. Rents are a problem in the free market theory. The same theory that defends capitalism also says rents are bad. And so if you want to be a real free market type, you got to understand that part of that whole body of economics also says that rents are not good. So I think this is going to be a challenge as societies, you know, whether they're in North America or in Europe or in Asia, deal with all this going on. But the one thing I'm sure about Technology always finds its own level. You're never going to stop it. And we've got decades more of Moore's Law coming. And you know, we're going to see changes that we've never even imagined. Some of them in, in health are going to be incredibly good. 
and you're going to be able to monitor your health on a real-time basis all the time and get there. But, you know, there's good and bad and everything. And I think technology, friend or foe, I don't think we have an answer to it yet. But if we don't do something, I think the answer is going to come down, unfortunately, that it's more on the foe side. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your attention and listening. <laughs>
And the social media figured out that in the course of a week, he wore 13 Rolex, different, different Rolex watches. And you know he was a low-level government functionary. And there was no way that since his annual salary was far less than one Rolex, there was no way he could possibly have 13. And he never thought about the fact that somebody, these pictures were just out, they were his pictures. He's putting them out to talk about his work. I mean, then again, there's the president of France, who apparently neglected to think that if you put on a motorcycle uniform and a motorcycle helmet, you should not wear your $1,500 custom shoes uh, that were his trademark, and that that's how he was easily identified. Uh, you know, you know, social media is, you know, it has changed the world forever, and in terms of how it is, I mean, there is a debate which Facebook was not the first. There were lots of others that tried and failed. So was Facebook the one to get it right, or did society have to change so that Facebook could work? And you know, there is a distinct trade-off that under people under 30 seem to have made that is enabled by technology, which is they live their lives enriched by a much larger number of more shallow relationships. And, and look, I mean, that's a, it's a reasonable trade-off. And you couldn't have done that 30 years ago. There's no way to do that. But today, with cell phones and social media, you can do that. And, and I don't, I'm not trying to make a value judgment. It's clear that's what's happened. Now, did that social change happen and Facebook caught the wave? Or did Facebook create the wave? I, I think historians may argue that in 20 years. Um, but, you know, Friendster was there, MySpace was there. I mean, other people tried and they failed. And they never figured out how to get it right. Did, did Mark uh, and his friends succeed in figuring that out? I don't know. Social media is, is permanent. But it's not, you know, I mean, it, Recent surveys show that most consumers trust a random review on Yelp more than they trust an entry in a paid travel guide. And, you know, I mean, okay, it's fact. I mean, maybe, maybe it's stupid, but it's fact. And so how do you, you know, again, we, we become accustomed to all these comments. But again, that also creates increased returns to scale because the chain stores know how to get likes. They know how to get you involved. They know how to feed the news. They know, I mean, it, it's a, uh, um, social media is here to stay. And, and I mean, you know, I don't think anything we can do is gonna change the way it works. Yes, sir. Well, Peter and I had a classmate who always said economists were a higher form of life. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, it clearly has. You know, and, and, and look, I, I became an economist for, you know, because I was doing organic chemistry. And uh, while I was, got A's in organic chemistry, I decided after a year of organic chemistry lab that I probably wasn't an organic chemist, and I became an economist instead. Uh, and, and by the way, economics and chemistry are almost completely the same because they're science of equilibrium. And the skills you build studying chemistry are the same skills you need to study economics. And there are a lot of, of economists over time who were chemists at one point in their careers. So I'm not the only one who have made that switch. And you, you know, look, my life is, my career is serendipity. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I couldn't possibly have planned it. I mean, in each stage I made decisions and I ended up where I am today. And it's been a great ride. I mean, I, you know, I've got to do a lot of things, seen a lot of things, met a lot of people, you know. Um, you know, I had a reporter in the Washington Post. Um, I was at a, a, a meeting of a tech dinner in Washington and we were talking about wearables, and you know, wearables are the in thing. Uh, everybody in the world's talking about what new wearable they have. 
And one of the things we were talking about was Google Glasses. Now, Google Glasses are, you know, interesting thing whether they're going to take off or not. And, you know, they just announced new ones with fancy frames. And I made the observation that um, I had just been at Sean Parker's wedding and there was nobody there wearing Google Glasses but one person. And I found that very interesting because it was a who's who of Silicon Valley. Uh, everybody else wanted to know is how did I get invited? Uh, and uh, it was the end of the night, but uh, it's, you know, serendipity, some luck. Uh, you know, I've been fired a couple times along the way. Uh, but, you know, if you don't stand for anything, you never get fired. But, you know, sometimes you have to stand for things too, so. That's life. One more question, maybe, maybe two. Ma'am? You said the economy is in a good shape. Why are there so many poor people? I said the upper 20% is in good shape. <laughs> I, I mean, no, you, 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 your, your question is right on. I mean, the upper 20%, I mean, if you, if you go to a restaurant in New York City or Silicon Valley or London, you have trouble getting a table. I mean, the top end restaurants are full, they're sold out, everything's great. The bottom part of the economy is struggling and, and struggling very hard. And information technology is enabling that, right? I mean, we have a very split world. But it's during that go to the restaurant. That's why people don't go to restaurants. It's what? Curious. Tourists. There aren't any tourists, in, in that, not now. No, no, no. I mean, it's not, I mean, I assure you, the. I mean, all the data shows that the upper strata of society, whether you cut it 10%, 20%, 30%, they are doing very well in almost all the markets. I mean, you go to Berlin, which is being driven right now by, you know, I mean, the essence of all this is that succeed in the world, you need creative people. And creative people now know their market power. And they didn't 20 years ago. And you need creative people. And the successful companies figure out, I have to do everything I need to do to get those creative people. And then I have to deal with that, whatever that is. Now, I don't know. You know, Google gives you free food within 150 feet. They give you, you know, massages, dry cleaning, transportation. They do whatever it takes to get the creative people. Because without the creative people, the rest of the people don't have a job. And it is a real change. And, and what's happened is, I mean, there are lots of programmers in Silicon Valley. By lots, I mean thousands that are programmers, developers, who 20 years ago would have made $100,000, $150,000, and today are making a million and a half to three and are getting paid. That. So now, if you're a good developer, where do you want to work? You want to work in Silicon Valley. Why? Because, I'm sorry, in Calgary, you're going to make 150000 but that same person in Silicon Valley might make 10 times that. And so you have huge immigration going to where the salaries are the highest. And, and Silicon Valley is now, a, it, it's a bubble. I mean, it, 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 it's just completely, you know, Facebook made 1,700 millionaires. Uh, so I, let me go on and take one. I'm over 65, so I, uh, uh, <laughs> I think we'll leave it at that. To thank our guest, I'm going to ask Dr. John Grace former Dean of Graduate Studies in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Dr. Grace. Well, tonight we've had a very interesting talk which has ranged very widely. 
I started out with John Kenneth Galgraith, who of course was Canadian. I, you probably realize that, uh, Bill, but uh, certainly a great Canadian. Guelph. And uh, he, oh, I'm sorry, from Guelph, Ontario, that's right. Uh, you've ranged over many, many topics. Certainly from a capitalist point of view, you've uh, told us very much about all kinds of things. Technology being unstoppable and of course it's multifarious effects on health, communications, surveillance, jobs, growth, inequality, unrest. And I think that has got most of us thinking and certainly those of us who are educators and need to think about the world and how technology and economics and all these things affect how our world works have been challenged tonight to, to think about those things by what you've said. So I want to thank you on behalf of the audience very much for coming and giving us and stimulating us to think about these very controversial and difficult topics. Thank you very much.